2019, we bought some land up in the mountains, just right outside Riversdale. And in 2020, amongst the pandemic, we moved here and called ourselves locals. But that's not really the sort of timeline we need to look at. This journey starts far further back than that. Just before the Industrial Revolution kicked in, around 93% of people were living rurally. Most people were living off the land, they were generating an income from the land itself. And over the next 100 years, in fact, over the next 260 years, there's been a radical change in the way that people lived. You know, with the introduction of factories, people suddenly had so many more things to purchase, but in order to get them, they had to go work at the factories to get the money to buy the things from the factories. And this caused a cycle. So by 2020, uh, sorry, by 2009, approximately 50% of the world's population was living in urban situations. And it's a big change. But the problem with this is that research that's coming out is saying that people that are in full-time employment are only really getting about three hours of productive time a day in that working environment. So we're sitting in the office, working for the man from eight to five, and only really getting three hours out. Those other five hours are lost to us. And unfortunately, because we're in the office, we can't just go and do some washing up or look after our kids or do all the other things that you would ordinarily do as a human. We sacrificed our priorities instead to earn the money. And by, 2020, uh, by 2014, I was in that place where I was going, mm, I don't really like this. I was radically separated from the mode of production. I had no land to put seeds in to grow my own food, and I was incredibly reliant on the system that we were all operating in. You know, it's a system that's stacked on a whole range of things, that if any one of them goes down, it all goes down. If our electricity goes down, our political system becomes unstable. If our education system goes down, the future looks quite bleak and poverty becomes a problem. And I was adamant that there must be some way to solve this. So we sat and put our mind to it and said, OK, cool, normal employment sounds like fun, but it can't be the only way to do this. So what we did was we said, let's set up some other approach. Let us come up with what we're calling here diverse micro-income portfolios, which is basically a really fancy way of saying, let's start some side gigs. <laughs> what we did is we basically broke them up into two parts and we said, in order for this thing to be sustainable, in order for us to actually potentially reach some sort of success out of it, we need to mix a risk of high risk opportunities and low risk opportunities. So low risk would be something like consulting work, freelance work, conventional employment, and high risk would be something like starting a business with a 1% chance of winning. Right? And you need to build a portfolio that kind of mixes these two so that you end up with lots of little opportunities that you can take a little bit from each of them rather than having one big opportunity that must work at all costs so that you can take everything else you need out of it. And this is the process I want to talk through. So in 2020, obviously, the world changed in some pretty significant ways. <laughs> you know, among this, about 2.2 million South Africans lost their job, amounting to about 13.4% of our employed workforce in this country. And suddenly, the fragility that I was experiencing in 2014 became something that others kind of started feeling. It became a bit of a fragile, helpless state where people were going, the world that we're working in now isn't really right, but I don't really have a way to solve it. I don't know what to do next other than trying to get another job. But I think this is really where the silver lining in this whole thing sits. For 260 years, we've been working for the man. We've been committing our priority to others to determine for us. Our time has been given away to our employer. And by virtue of the fact that now people are working more at home, with approximately 56% of people are working at least part of their time at home, people without jobs, etc., it means that we have an opportunity to reconfigure the way we work so that we can live and work in the places where we want to be, which I assure you is not an office. Well, certainly in my experience, it's not an office. The good news is that we've got the internet, and what the internet means is that as somebody working, you can work anywhere and you can sell everywhere. You know, your time and your energy in this local place can be distributed to anywhere in the world. You can go and get clients in New Zealand if that's what you want to do. It's just meant that we as the global village have now got everything in our pockets. We can pull out our phone and we can communicate with literally anyone. If you want to talk to Beyonce, go for it. You can. You've got Twitter. There's no problem there. She's probably not going to listen, but that's a different whole discussion. <laughs> the other side of it is we've got YouTube and the ability to get skills and to transfer inf information and knowledge from the others who have really kind of gone through the process already is enormous. There's literally nothing you cannot learn off YouTube if you only had that one place. And inside this, we've also got now a great opportunity because people have got more time on their hands and because people have got, you know, people are working at home and many people have been retrenched, all of those skills that were otherwise tied into that traditional system are now available. You know, in my own case, when COVID hit and um, things started getting a bit hectic, 
you know, by the 1st of April, we started three new businesses with people that we would have otherwise never had an opportunity to work with because their time was all bound into their working employment scenario. They had amazing skills and amazing opportunities, but were otherwise out of touch and out of availability. So the question is, okay, fine, this sounds like fun, but where do we start here? The way we started was we said, we've got two things to consider. First of all, what is the lifestyle that we actually want to live? You know, for us, we wanted to go back to the kind of pre-industrial time where we could go outside, get soil on our feet, grow our own food, be less reliant on central systems, and find a little different way to do it. On the value side, we said, we want to be doing it where we balance social good and our own good. Uh, the particular model we applied is something called transformational entrepreneurship. Um, and it has all sorts of manifestations, but in our context, we basically, in some of our businesses, we give up to 50% of our profit back to charity as a way of feeding back into that cycle. Short-term winning is not really what I want to be doing. In this, there's this process that we came up with, and there's a lot of detail in here. I'm going to go through all the pieces of it. But you can choose, basically, how hectically you want to go into this thing. You can keep your day job, and you can still apply this model. In our case, we went completely militant, and we went extreme in every regard. So we downsized, we moved into a worker's cottage in the Eastern Cape. It had, I mean, it, we spent about 20% of what we were spending previously on rent, which is great. But we didn't have any electricity, we didn't have any water, none of those things. We basically got just solar panels so that we could get internet and charge our laptops. Not even internal lighting, it was great. Um, and you can then decide how many times you go through this flow. In our case, over the last six years, we did about 20 side gigs over the time period, many of them concurrently, with the purpose of finding a way to get out of the system. So the flow goes basically, downsize if you can, audit for bleeding, start a side gig, find equitable partnerships to help you get there, and scale what you got, and if you've got it in you, and if you're feeling like you might have enough guts to go, do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again. But again, up to you. So let's start with step one. First step is downsize. If you have an opportunity to downsize, go for it. It's not possible for everyone, people who've got bonds, children, schooling, it may not be all that possible. But if you're young, you have an opportunity to radically reduce your cost in a way that wasn't possible in previous years. And again, you can decide how hectic you go. I spoke to you about our Eastern Cape adventure, but one really can downscale down to a caravan if that's what you wanted to do. You can decide how militaristic you want to get about it. But ultimately, it comes down to distinguishing between, between what are your needs and what are your wants. And particularly in the wants, it's the things that society tells you that you actually need. You know, you need a BMW. No, you don't. You want a BMW. But society puts all that pressure on you to make that distinction. So step one is then saying, let's audit for bleeding. And this is particularly around looking at where's my time and where's my money being wasted. It's the little things. You know, it's, it's saying, if I'm watching Netflix every night, what can I do if I just watched half as much? How can I reutilize that time to get something more valuable out? in that half. The same thing with my money. I don't need to be buying random things, expensive things. There's only a certain number of things that I actually need. And if I can simplify right down to that, there's huge efficiencies that one can get. There's surpluses that you find, up, find that you didn't know you had, and little corners that you can kind of pull out on there. Inside that is debt. And basically the comment here is, do everything you can either not to take it on, and if you've got it, deal with it, because it's incredibly inefficient suddenly a certain percentage of your workday gets given to the bank, and, well, frankly, I'm not for that. Ultimately, we're trying to stop the things that aren't actually progressing us towards the lifestyle and the things that aren't sitting inside the value set that we want to govern in terms of how we get to that lifestyle. Step two, let's start a side gig. So here, the purpose and the definition of a side gig is basically to say, how do we get our expenses to be less than our income in a sustainable way. So anything that is either going to reduce your expenses or increase your income is an adequate side gig for me. <clears throat> and the way to start here is the things you know with. So if you have a, a history of working in whichever it is, if let's say you're a designer, if let's say you're a speaker, let's say that you lay bricks, whatever it is, start with the things that you know. There's certain skills, there's certain capacities that you already have. It's not like you need to learn something new. All you need to do is find out how to sell it on the internet. Start small. You know, big things are complicated. Small things aren't. Don't start a business with the purpose of being a Facebook or a billion-dollar business. Those things don't work, and there's only one in a billion of them that does. Can't gamble like that. It's not a sustainable future. Instead, start small. Aim for the 100 rand a day, 100 rand a month, 1,000 rand a month. And if you're doing really well, maybe you'll make 10,000 rand a month. Great. But aiming for more than that is just setting yourself up for failure. I tried it. It doesn't work. In that, one needs to pick projects where one can literally do all parts of it oneself. 
you know, you initially starting a project, you don't have money. I promise you, you don't have money. You can't afford to pay anyone. You need to be asking favors for anything that's outside of your skill set. So pick a project that fits into your specific skills, where you yourself can do all of it, where you can be a one-man or woman army. If you're looking for some ideas, you know, if you've got a green thumb, start a veggie patch. I think that's probably the most productive thing you can do because not only does it help you save your costs, but you could potentially sell it on the other side and generate an income off your cost, cost saving. If you've got an arts and crafts experience, or if you've got sewing experience, anything like that, all of those sorts of skills can be sold through the internet by this sort of distributed global community that we're now in. And obviously, if you have any professional services, there's ample platforms online where you can sell your hours as a professional person. You know, if you're organized. Maybe it's a good opportunity to sell yourself as a personal assistant to some American and use the exchange rate to your advantage. <laughs> Ultimately, in this one, you need to prioritize towards the learnings and focus on the things that you're going to that are going to develop you the fastest into the future. Ultimately, what you want to be doing is outcompeting your competition through learning itself. So, if you can outlearn your competition, you will win at a more at, a, at an increasing rate in time. And sometimes it's better actually just to take the learning rather than the revenue when that option is available. Inside this, we also need to accept that failure is literally guaranteed. I promise you, it's guaranteed, and it's kind of comforting to feel it that way. You know, you're going to fail, but every single time you, fa you do fail, provided you're applying the learning philosophy into it, you're going to come out of it with better position and better decision capacity into your next situation. You know, ultimately, the future decisions you make are going to be based on the learnings of the past. So focus in on that and accept that it's part of it. Step three: Now that you've got yourself a little side gig on the go, life's cool. You've increased your income, reduced your expenses. Life's good, but you're not going to go very far on your own. Or at least if you do, it's going to be really lonely and really boring. So what you want to be doing is finding partners that are as different to you as possible. You know, the idea is that I can stand here and I can represent a position, but it's only ever from my particular vantage point, my, my particular capacities, and my particular mental models. As you add more people to your system, you get different perspectives that show you things that you couldn't possibly see. It really is the difference being the power. Diversity is your strength. When you're going through it, find people that you actually want to work with. You know, often people go and start businesses or start partnerships simply because they want to get to the outcome, but they don't really think that they've got to actually talk to these people every single day, work with them on a day-to-day -day basis, and you know you really are building a partnership in more kind of a marriage-type style than a traditional business-type style. Those kind of 21st-century thinking of just business for business are out. We're now building relationships and using those relationships to work, and that means that inside that one needs to start with a first date. A second date, a third date. You know, start a little project. Check that you actually like working with each other. Start a second bigger project, etc., etc. And eventually, maybe you'll make a business baby. Excellent. <laughs> Ultimately, we need to be sitting down and securing for equality. You know, in a system of partnership, an unequal partnership just cannot sustain itself. And the same is true in business. It used to be the case that you know you could have one person taking more than everyone else. But I think the conventional wisdom of the 21st century is that if one person wins, everybody loses. Because it just cannot sustain itself in the long term. Inside this, by virtue of the fact that we're taking people as different as you as possible, it also means that their inputs, requirements, expectations, desires, aren't necessarily the same as yours. So be very conscious of this and pay very careful attention to finding deals into your system and deals in your partnership that really serve each person in it. You know, if one person has brought money to the table, then maybe they don't need to get paid in the short amount, short term. Whereas the other person is living day to day, they need the money now. So setting up a deal with three people where it's 30% shared equity doesn't actually solve the problem of the people that are that are in the partnership anymore. Step four: scale your values. So you've got a little side gig, you've brought some partners on board, life's happy. Now you want to make it a bit bigger.、And、the way to do this is to focus first on where the value is actually most present. You know, go and talk to your customers, go and engage your market, go and speak to the people that are actually bringing you your money, and say what part of what I'm doing is most valuable. Focus in on that. Stop doing the rest. And you'll find suddenly that you get a bunch of time into the process. And equally, don't be taking risks at all in this process. You can take a time risk, but don't take big, gnarly, oh, this might work risks. Think of it more like winching yourself forward rather than flying a kite in the in the wind. And ultimately, we sit and we work from a process of high chaos and high disorder, where you're figuring out what it is that you're doing. And over time, you move into a situation of order, of controlled chaos, etc. And I think it's really important to pay attention and build processes that help you transition from this chaos into the order. Because ultimately, through that conversion, you're going to create more free time for yourself, so that you can focus back into the projects that you're already working on. 
Once you've gone through these steps, it's then a case of going, okay, well, let's do a review. Where am I at? And ultimately, it comes down to two questions. First of all, does my income ex exceed my expense? Basically, am I surviving? If you are, cool. If you're not, not a big problem, probably very uncomfortable, but you can survive. The second question is, do I have more time? And that basically, between the four the, uh, those four outputs that come from there, you've basically got two outcomes or three outcomes that you're going to take. Either you're going to start another side gig, which is my preferred approach, um, you're going to reduce your expenses, or you're going to hire someone in to free up more of your time so that you can go and start the side gigs again. Right? So it's all about this trade between these three points. When selecting these side gigs, it's really important to try diversify them as much as possible. So it's no good to make come up with five businesses or five side gigs that are all exactly the same. Because if that market shifts, then your resilience isn't actually gained. You want them as different as possible. And the advantage to that, too, is that you're going to learn way more from these diverse inter, inter kind of sections between these interesting ideas rather than trying one thing and being a specialist at this one focus area. Inside that, don't gamble. Once you've got a project set up, don't trade it for a future ambition. Cinch it in. Get it stable. Don't gamble on it. Don't risk the future of it and what, you've, or what you want to do next. If at this point you're going, hmm, I'm feeling healthy, I'm feeling good, I've got the energy in the bank, you have the option of going back to step one and adding a side gig to the mix. But ultimately, we're talking about time freedom here. And the question is, well, OK, this sounds like a lot of work, Tim. How do we get to time freedom? And the answer is empowering others. As you're setting up your systems and bringing people in, the better you can empower them, the more of the work and the more of the day-to-day -day they can do and you don't have to. And what that means is that the better you empower your team, the more th things you can step out of and the more you can rely on them to do it for you. And this is saying, again, we're going in from an equitable perspective here. So you're not trying to abuse your staff or your partners. You're setting it up so that it wins for them and it wins for you at the same time. Equally, you also want to take as little as you can out of it. You know, permaculture talks about a, a take only a fair share, but I think the same principle applies here. If you've got multiple opportunities running, it's about taking a little bit from each of them rather than saying, OK, this one's going to pay my way. You know, and it means that then you've got more opportunity to employ other people, to share the wealth, etc. But there are a couple of truths in here. The first of it is that it's long and hard, and I can guarantee you it's exhausting. But it, and it can take an enormously long amount of time. But the, question, well, the, the point of this is that as long as you don't stop, you can survive. As long as you keep it cheap, you can keep it running. And the longer it runs, the better the chance of success. Inside here, we've also got South Africa with probably the, what does have among the worst failure rates of businesses globally, which means starting one business is hugely, hugely dangerous. And typically, four out of five businesses fail. But if you can start five businesses, the risk starts reducing quite radically. If you start 10 businesses, now you've got two winners. If you start 20 businesses, which is what we did, you might end up with four winners. And that then means you can diversify your risk, push out the ones that fail, keep the ones that work, and off you go. But ultimately, this is a learning journey. You can't know what you know before you start. You have to explore it. You have to go down the path, stub your toe, bang your head, scratch your face, hurt yourself along the way, maybe. But you're going to learn through the process and develop as you go. So as we sit here in the end of 2021, my only real hope is that at least some of you decide to add a side gig to the mix. Don't make it big. Don't make it ambitious. Start a veggie patch. You know, it'll improve your health. It'll improve your happiness. And hell, heck, maybe you'll make some profit off the back of it. Just as a side thought, for those of you that are going, OK, Tim, this sounds like fun, but I've got energy. I really want to go for it. There's this lovely concept we call time stacking, which is the idea that in every business, certainly in my experience, you have these high periods of intensity followed by long waits while the market matures or the sales you know, takes for the sales to convert, etc. What you can do is, if you've got the energy and the guts for it, is you sit down and you say, OK, my project's going to take me a month of high focus, and then I've got, say, five months while I wait for it to mature. But if in that, so what it means, in the second month, you can now start a second business. And in the third month, you start another business. In the fourth month, you start another business. In the fifth month, you start another business. In the sixth month, the first one matures. And you work on that. And then you can keep feeding them into themselves like this. And as a result, I mean, that's essentially how we got to 20. But one can put a lot of projects on the go concurrently. But just be so very cautious here. If they mature in a way that you don't expect, you can have a very, very, very difficult few weeks of very high pressure. I've been there a bunch of times. It's not great fun. And I will leave you there. Thank you very much.